And Sean, do you think that that is the weakest part of a Christian or theistic worldview, or do you think that there's something else that's actually more troublesome? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what to say. What disturbs you the most? Yeah, I think that the, the, the most troublesome part of the Christian worldview is I don't think it's true. I think that's, <laughs> that's the worst part. Um, what is the hardest thing to believe, or what do you think is the most logically inconsistent then, besides it not being true? <laughs> you know, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not trying to weasel out, I'm, I don't necessarily think that it is logically inconsistent. I can certainly imagine a world in which God existed and cared about us human beings and uh, judged us and rewarded us and, and there was an afterlife and whatever version of uh, the, the religious uh, goodie bag you want to uh, keep. Uh, or not, I can imagine a sort of deistic universe in which God makes the universe and then goes away. I think that all these are plausible. Are you saying that this, that, that could be this universe? But you don't no, tend towards that? No, not. <laughs> I'm saying that those could be universes. I, so I think that you know, where, where the trouble comes in is if I think that, to me, it, it really is an empirical question, not a logical question. I think that if I try to be honest and I try to forget about what the universe is actually like, what I know to be true in the universe, and if I try to ask myself, what would I expect the universe to be like under theism and under naturalism, there's such an enormously large disconnect between what I would expect the universe to be like under theism and what the universe is actually like that I don't think that's a bridgeable gap. I, don't think, I think the universe is big and we are small. I think that there's all sorts of random suffering in the universe. I think that there are completely different religions that people grow up in depending on where they were born and what year they were born in. I think that there's you know, no good evidence for violations of the laws of physics that we would qualify as miracles and so forth. And I think that if theism were true, these would be way different, not like a little bit different. I think it'd be perfectly obvious. How in the world can God exist and care about us and leave us any room for doubt? That just boggles my mind. Yeah, I think there has been progress. I think there's been progress in theology and in philosophy. In theology, what greater progress could you imagine than figuring out that God does not exist? You know, that's a, a, a certain <laughs> kind of progress that is, is quite concrete. In philosophy, you know, I think that one of the, the single biggest mistake that scientists take when, when developing an attitude toward philosophy is to judge philosophy by how useful it is to science. Mm -hmm. It's a different realm of endeavor. So, you know, I think it's unfair to philosophy to say, well, what has it done for the typical working scientist? Now, as a matter of fact, to me, who is an untypical working scientist, philosophy has been very useful. I've gotten a lot of ideas about philosophy of physics from uh, about physics, rather, from philosophers of physics, because there's a very specific kind of philosophy of physics that is more or less indistinguishable in its goals from just doing physics, right? It's just right. that philosophy departments are a little bit more sympathetic to, to foundations of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, or for that matter, cosmology. Right. So I think that, you know, we're all trying to figure out how the universe works in a fairly intellectually similar way, but there's a slight difference in what department you're in, so I think that's just completely irrelevant. Uh, but you know, there's, there's also progress in good old-fashioned philosophy. There's progress in moral and ethical philosophy. There's progress in metaphysics. So you know, the progress is harder, harder to judge and harder to make. But to say that there's no progress is just to not pay attention very carefully. It's, uh, there's, there's no inconceivability in thinking that everything that we know is true. And yet, there is a higher dimension or a higher domain of existence that sort of, uh, in which this one is included. But listen, I, mean, that's, I think that's a, a perfect thing to have said in this debate because it illustrates the difference here. No evidence was given for this claim. No reason to believe it was given. All we are given is, well, maybe it's true and you can't absolutely disprove it. Maybe it is conceivable. We have laws of physics that tell us how the moon moves around the earth and they work very well. It is conceivable that there are also angels living inside the moon guiding it around in exactly the way that Newton's laws tell us. But we don't take that seriously as an idea because there's no need for it or evidence for it. So the question is not, is it conceivable that there are other realms? The question is, is the evidence in favor of that other realm so overwhelming 
that it causes us to dismiss the enormous successes of physics, chemistry, biology, and neuroscience. No. You know, the idea that uh, we could be convinced of an, another realm in addition to the natural world is obviously yes. There's a million pieces of evidence that would help convince me. None of, I mean, if, this, if there's a ghost in the room that could lift up that glass right now, then I would be convinced. <laughs> For those listening on the radio, the glass is not moving. And it, it never moves when you do this. And we live in a world that looks exactly like there's only the natural but world. But wouldn't you really kind of like those guys to be right? Wouldn't it be great? Yes and no. I think that there's obviously advantages. Yeah. I, I don't want to die. <laughs> I want to live after I die, maybe not for infinity years, but for a few hundred thousand years. I could amuse myself. Uh, sadly, uh, as a very wise philosopher once said, you can't always get what you want. So the scientific conclusion today is that the mind is the brain. If new dramatic evidence comes to light that changes that, I will happily move along with the evidence. Sean Carroll, take a crack at the same question. I think you know, it's a great question because there's this image, like when we're teaching high school in science, that it's a bunch of facts that are absolutely established, whereas professional scientists like to brag about the fact that, like Stephen just did, that you know we're always skeptical and we're always ready to throw out everything. And, and both are true, but because there's some intermediate ground. There are many, many things that science does not understand, and we're hoping to get better at it. Many, many things. And there are also some things that science does understand and are not going to go away. This table is made of atoms. We will improve our understanding of what an atom is, what the elementary particles and fields are that make it up, how they interact. That is not finished yet. We can do better. But a million years from now, our best scientific understanding will still say that the table is made of atoms. In my judgment, the current status of our scientific understanding, the parts that we're not going to give up, are enough to conclude that death is, in fact, final. But he also tried to address the question in the title of his book, What is Life? When is a piece of matter said to be alive? And it's a wonderful, thought-provoking answer. Basically, he says, something is alive when it keeps moving long after it should have stopped. <laughs> That's what it means. You have a little chicken, baby chick, grows up to be a chicken. As long as you feed it, it's going to move around. It's going to flap around and raise its wings and so forth. Cluck. When it dies, it will stop moving. It will decompose and it will return to the ground. And so Schrodinger wants to know, what is going on? What is it that keeps alive things moving and walking around and making noise and raising a fuss? And the answer, as he, as he quite correctly puts it, is my favorite law of physics, the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics is a very, this is not the same chick that was on the cover. <laughs> Death, what can you do? Uh, the second law of thermodynamics is the law that says that the entropy of the universe or of any closed isolated bit of the universe increases as time goes on. Entropy is simply a measure of the disorderliness, the messiness, the chaotic nature of stuff. If you start with an unbroken egg, it is easy to break the egg. That makes it more disorderly and disorganized. It is easy to turn that broken egg into scrambled eggs. Again, more disorganized. It is very, very difficult and would never happen by itself to take the scrambled eggs and make it back into the pristine form of an unbroken egg, Humpty Dumpty notwithstanding. <laughs> So this law is very, very profound, and it captures people's imaginations at a sort of social and personal level as well as a scientific level. It also captures the imagination of creationists because they say, look, there's a fundamental law of physics. You're telling us one of the famous laws of 19th century science says that things run down that things become less and less organized over time, that ultimately the universe will reach heat death, and yet you expect me to believe that all of the marvelous complexity of life and the biosphere and evolution that you guys talk about all just happened here on Earth starting from some disorderly primordial goo. How is that possible? Now, there's two answers to this. One is the simple and perfectly correct and short answer, which is, Isolated systems, we said. And the Earth is not an isolated system. There's a little story you can find on the internet. I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but it's a creationist saying, you know, the physicists always say the Earth is not an isolated system, but that can't be right because if it were, there would be a giant glowing ball of energy in the sky. 
<laughs> Here's a picture I took of the Big Bang. This is right after the Big Bang, one second. And now sometimes you will see the Big Bang, which happened 13.8 billion years ago, portrayed as like a bright dot in a black background, and that is completely wrong. That makes you think that the Big Bang was an event with a location at a place in a pre-existing space-time, which is not right. The Big Bang is the whole universe coming into existence. So this is what it would have looked like if you were there one second after the Big Bang. It was hot, it was dense, it was smooth, it was the same everywhere. It was shining with the brightness of, I don't know, some really bright thing, the whole universe. <laughs> As time goes on, here's a snapshot, and this really is a photograph, 38,000 years, sorry, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is the moment when the universe became transparent. This is an image in the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. And what you're seeing now is the gradual formation of structure. The universe is growing increasingly lumpy and inhomogeneous. The blue spots are a little bit emptier. The red and yellow spots are a little bit heavier, a little bit more dense. And if you let time goes on, go on, gravity increases the contrast knob of the universe, and we get this wonderful, beautiful picture of galaxies and stars and superclusters. And this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is now about 10 to the 10 years after the Big Bang, one of the iconic and most beautiful images that human beings have ever produced. If you point your telescope at a blank spot of the sky and you open the shutter on your camera, then this is what you will see as long as your camera is hooked up to the Hubble Space Telescope. This is what <laughs> you will see. We live in a world with hundreds of billions of galaxies and how, who knows how many conventions are going on with extraterrestrials fighting to keep church and state separate in their <laughs> local environment. And very often it ends here. The story you're told the universe ends here, but this is not the end. The universe will continue to, to evolve even after we're not here. Here's a picture of the universe one quadrillion years after the Big Bang. That's because ultimately the stars will burn out. About 10 to the 15 years after the Big Bang, the last star will stop shining. We'll have nothing in the universe but cold rocks and black holes. I know. <laughs> but even that will not be the end because all those rocks, those planets, those dead stars, those comets will fall into the black holes. And Stephen Hawking in the 1970s taught us that black holes do not last forever. Black holes give off radiation. They will evaporate. They will eventually disappear. That will take one Google years in the good old fashioned sense of the word Google before the search engine took over. 10 to the 100 years from now, the last black hole will have evaporated and will be nothing left but empty space. And our best current model is that empty space lasts forever, infinity years into the future. So that's the history of the universe. So here's a picture of the history of the universe. And I want you to notice something about this picture. Entropy increases as the universe expands. So on the left, soon after the Big Bang, the fact that the universe was very smooth is actually in that physical circumstance, a reflection of the fact that it's very orderly. It was so dense and the gravity was so strong that keeping everything smooth is a very, very rare and finely tuned state of affairs. Entropy grows as the universe expands, structure forms, stars shine, people live and die, and eventually you reach empty space, which turns out, if you go through the math, to be a very high entropy state. But complexity, the organization, of the stuff that is going on is a completely different thing than entropy. On the left, in the beginning, the universe was a very simple place. It was just hot, dense, and smooth. At the end, a Google years from now, the universe will be a simple place once again. It will be empty space. It is in between when the entropy is increasing from low to high that the universe becomes complex, that it forms planets and stars and galaxies and living organisms. And that behavior is not an accident. That is a universal kind of thing that complexity does. Entropy just goes up, but complexity first goes up and then fades away once you approach the final state, which we call thermal equilibrium. So the right answer to the creationists is that it's not only is it allowed by the second law of thermodynamics that complex structures like living beings arose here on Earth, but the reason why complex structures like living beings arose here on Earth is because of the second law of thermodynamics. Here is a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a few hundred out of the hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. The theistic explanation for cosmological fine-tuning asks you to look at this picture and say, I know why it's like that. 
It's because I was going to be here or we were going to be here. But there is nothing in our experience of the universe that justifies the kind of flattering story we like to tell about ourselves. In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine-tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with, the, with each other to grow up under different local conditions. Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all, so can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. Immanuel Kant famously said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. In other words, sure, you can find some physical explanation for the motion of the planets, but never for something as exquisitely organized and complex as a biological organism. Except, of course, that Charles Darwin then went and did exactly that. We can paraphrase Dr. Craig's message as saying, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the cosmos. But everything we know about the history of science and the current state of physics says we should be much more optimistic than that. Thank you.